when Ben asked me to do the keynote, my first thought was he couldn't find anybody else to do the keynote. Um, <laughs> and uh, because I, I put on these conferences and I've, I won't say I've scrambled before, but I look to my community first, the speakers that I most want to see. And so I was honored and I am honored. And I thought, okay, my turn for what I consider to be my community, <clears throat> so Association for Software Testing. What do I want to tell my community? So I thought about it and I came up with an idea and I ran it by Ben and he said, argument, hmm, very interesting, swinging for the fences, eh? And I, I was flattered and I said, yeah, I'm swinging for the fences on this one. I want to talk about argument. And he let me make my abstract and didn't question that. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can live up to the pitch that was thrown to me to be, to anchor this keynote, anchor this conference. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm nervous, I admit. I have uh, some content in these slides that is, I've never uh, vetted before. Uh, it's not my first keynote, but I'm, I think I'm more nervous because I see so many friends and colleagues out in the audience, and I'm just hoping I live up to my reputation. So I thought, okay, I can do what keynotes do and either start with a joke or start with a survey. So I decided I can do both, I can, I can do this. I can say, uh, how many people out there think I'm really awesome? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, all right. I wasn't gonna look, I was just gonna. Um, because I thought, okay, I wanna do a keynote I would actually go to. I'm not a morning person, but I do like cast, and I go to every, for, I haven't been to every cast, but I'm into most of them. And usually I'm not disappointed. Um, so, uh, but invariably, when I do a talk, it's almost magical that five, 10 minutes before the keynote, something coincidental happens that is entirely relevant to what I wanna say. And that happened today. I knew it was gonna happen, I just didn't know what it was gonna be. And maybe, maybe there's that Celestine prophecy effect that if you're looking for coincidence, you will find it or it will find you. You become more of a magnet for coincidence. So here's what happened. Um, many months ago, Ben Kelly, who is a program chair of this conference and a fellow eBay colleague, uh, wanted me to, uh, asked if it was okay if I could, uh, if he could ship something to me, an item in the Bay Area and I would hold it for him before seeing him at CAST. And I said, sure, yeah, ship it to me and I'll give it to you at CAST. And uh, so I did that, I gave it to him. And as a, uh, uh, as a thank you, he gave me this book, A Thousand Years of Annoying the French, okay? And it's a thick book. And I have no idea what this book is about. And, and he said, I wanted to do something like, out of the ordinary and so I'm trying to find the meme right what is the anchoring thing that you know Ben would like to bestow upon me here and can I make this work is this the coincidence that was handed to me and I found it even though I'm flipping backwards there's a lot of text here I found it in the front and it reads this the English, by nature, always want to fight their neighbors for no reason, which is why they all die badly. <laughs> this is from the Journal d'une Bourgeois de Paris, written, by, uh, written during the Hundred Years' War. Underneath that quote is another quote from the Duke of Wellington, who is in English. Quote, we have been, we are, and I trust we always will be des detested by the French. So back to back, you see an argument there. So I said, okay, that's good. That's gold. I'm going to lead with that. But wait, on the next page, a selection of English synonyms for annoy. Remember, 
Hundred, a thousand years of annoying the French. Provoke, infuriate, anger, incense, arouse, offend, affront, outrage, aggrieve, wound, hurt, sting, embitter, irritate, aggravate, exasperate, peeve, myth, ruffle, rile, rankle, enrage, infuriate, madden, drive crazy, mad, insane, get uh, up the back on the tits of, bust the balls of, piss off, Thank you, you've been a great audience. That's my keynote. That's, um, <laughs> it's now open season. Um, I got a little more to say. Oh, so thank you, Ben. Uh, that is Pittsburgh. I can't wait to see the thousand years of or knowing the French. Um, I didn't want to do slides, by the way. I thought I'd do my first a cappella talk. I go acoustic, because slides are a crutch. If you've seen me speak, you also know that I'm an extrovert, and I don't know what I'm going to say a few seconds before, only until a few seconds I, I say it, right? Um, and about three days ago, I said, okay, I'll just do a couple slides. It's now 45 slides. I will whip through most of them, but I just kept finding more and more I wanted to have on record. And it's kind of funny because some people go, oh, can we see your slides? And if you've seen a really good keynote, there's, there's a lot of pictures and like one-liners, and you don't get any sense of what the speaker said from the slides. Uh, these slides, you'll get a sense of what it is. So there's a lot of text there, and not a lot of bullet points, I have to say, but, uh, but on, on with uh, a message. Uh, and here's the heart of it, my dear colleagues. I think we need to argue more. I think we need to argue more. Hmm? I'm wrong? <laughs> Screw you. No. Um, I'm right. No. I know that was Paul Holland. It sounded like Paul. It wasn't. I'm here. Oh, okay. That's how he was thinking it. That's how well I know Paul. It came from back there. Hey, <laughs> yeah, your ventriloquism skills are great. I have a brother named James. My brother James. Uh, it can be argued fairly well, I might add, is a lightning rod in our industry, in software testing, right? And I am no such lightning rod. In fact, I'm quite the opposite. And when, when we have done talks together, he and I, um, he makes an intro something like, uh, you can tell us apart, me and my brother, because um, I'm the one with hair, he says, and my brother has the capacity to love. <laughs> Thank you, James. I'll, I'll take that. So let me lead with something he said recently on Twitter. <laughs> Someone has to be an asshole. Polite people aren't going to change this industry. They made it the way it is. August 3rd. All right. Let me get the level of the room. How are you feeling about that, you polite people? Like me, with the capacity to love us? I made the industry the way it is. Now, I could look at it as, hey, yeah, I made the industry the way it is. That's not what he means, right? <laughs> I think the tone is, you made the industry the way it is. See, see the difference, right? And that's, oh, I didn't talk to him about this. He doesn't know that this is my opening slide. And now I learn it's going to be on YouTube. So, hi, James. <laughs> Thank you, Ben, for taping this. Um, okay. So, for you in the room, I started to think, okay, I use, I'm using my brother's um, notion of the dark room test which goes, if you want to know the value of a talk or a keynote or an idea at any given time, if you can think of those same things by being alone in a dark room for five minutes, it's not that special, right? It's my take on his thing. But I started to put myself in your position and, and mingled that with some of mine. Your response could be, oh, someone has to be an asshole. People, polite people aren't going to change the industry. They made it the way it is. So one response you might say is, no, they didn't. Or, what? Or, I'm polite, and I think I'm changing the industry, so screw you. I'm going him. 
Um, or you could say, uh, excuse me? Or come on, that's ridiculous. Or you're being ridiculous. Or are you, are you serious? You're kidding. You're joking. Are you joking? You can't really mean that. Are you crazy? Seriously? Prove it. And what the hell are you talking about? All right. So I put a red background. Remember, I said we need argument. Now, these are some real responses, not to James's quote, but about argument that I've seen when particularly someone like James is involved in an argument with someone else. Or there's a debate in our industry. Here's what I've heard. And I, if this is you, you'll recognize it, but I stripped your name. Why do we need to fracture our community by fighting out the war of ideas so publicly? What happened to just, this is someone else, by the way, it's a different quote. Why can't we just say we respectfully disagree and leave it at that? How about respect? Can't we all just cherish this and be passionate about what we feel is best? And you guys arguing, it just dilutes the message of the tester. And I, I fear that the impact um, will be to the humble tester on the ground. And why is this so, why does it have to be so political? It, it reminds me of the Rodney King quote, like, can't we all just get along? When the riots were happening in LA in 1993, I believe it was because he was the one that was beaten down by police officers and started all these riots because the police officers were found not guilty. And he went on and he said, can't we all just get along? And so when I see these quotes in blue and the feeling is, can't we all just get along? I wanna say, no, no, we can't. And there's reasons why. Here's one of them. I have five lessons, by the way, and uh, I will try to keep track of time, so I'm curious I do these. Now, these are lessons I've learned. And some keynotes, in fact, even this keynote, there was a draft where I say, we need to claim our territory first. And I thought, hmm, I don't want to speak for you, really. I suppose I could say people in general, but I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist. So I'm owning this. I need to claim my territory before I can recognize my opponent's side. And I bring up this, this graphic, which I bet evokes some feelings in you, especially if you're from the United States. We are in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is what color on this map? It's blue, it's a blue state. It's actually a red state, and it's Madison that makes it blue. The politics in Madison, that's what I've heard. Yeah, and um, most of the state is Republican, from what I heard. Uh, and that's interesting. Now you expect the, West, the western states, like Washington and Oregon and California, more liberal, more progressive, right? And you, you expect the, the, the south to be more conservative, but there's the, the map of the last election and where people stood. And I began to think, why do I need to claim my territory first? Now I'm keynoting at CAST, it's my favorite conference. I consider you my community because as Paul and, and Deanne and Ben said, you're allowed and encouraged, nay, required to debate Speakers, and if there's energy in the room, as we say, the next speaker gets bumped. That happened in cast one. Guess who the keynote was? James Bach. Guess what the, the debate was about certification? Stuart Reed in the room, who is a, a, a proponent of certification. And if you're at cast one, which is 2006, that went long. And James was pretty gracious, I might add. He could have just continued to skewer this guy, and he yielded, I thought, very gracefully. 
And that, you know, I, I've known my brother almost all my life. Um, <laughs> sometimes I go, I don't know you. Who are you? Um, are you from the same family? But it taught me who he was. Uh, as does any contentious topic. It also tells us who we want to be, this claiming of our territory. Do I want to be conservative? Do I want to be progressive? In fact, this map is flawed because caste is context-driven. And we could look at it through the lens of a context-driven mindset and go, wait a minute, Wisconsin's really red. You drive around to any little town and you'll, they'll seem Republican or conservative. So why is it blue? Context. Context. Sometimes I'm conservative. Sometimes I'm progressive. Depends on what the issue is. So, but I get to decide. Not some pollster, right? Well, even though they will, they'll try to put me in a bucket so they can manage me. So I have a choice, who I want to be. It also challenges what I think I know. This slide used to say what I, what I know. And I backed off on that. And I started to think about it. <laughs> okay, what I think I know. That gets questioned, especially when you do a talk at CAST. You think you know your topic? Wait till open season. You're going to learn something. In fact, I forgot to bring an easel and a flip chart up here because I know open season is going to teach me something. And I don't want to pontificate to you that I know the answers. I just want to take this rare opportunity I have to lead a discussion right now. Well, in a little bit, I'll get to the open season part. But I'm the captain of the ship right now and I'm, I take that very seriously as a keynote. So I'll say my piece and then I'll, uh, I'll invite yours. But whether you're doing a keynote or whether you're listening to one, you've got to feel safe. Right, I've had a keynote, actually at CAST, I think it was uh, maybe Esther Derby doing one, where we all had to get into groups and do this exercise, and there might have even been some singing, I don't know. I don't feel safe in those, I'm not gonna ask you to sing, I promise. I'm not asking, gonna ask you to stand up or dance. I need to claim my territory first. And usually at a keynote, by the way, it's in the back of the room, I feel safe in the back of the room. Because if I get mad or annoyed and I want to leave, I, I feel like I don't want to be disruptive. And I need to know a, 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 an argument uh, helps me know what my values are. All right, I want to click next on the next slide, okay? And I want you to pay attention to how you feel. Okay, you ready? I found this graphic online. That is Edward Snowden, by the way, if you don't know. And some of you might think he's a traitor to the United States, and some of you may think he's a patriot in the United States. I don't know how you, you from other countries feel. You may feel the same way. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Uh, you know, he's under contract. He's a contractor, right? I've been a contractor before. And you, you agree to certain things that you won't do. But I also believe in, in uh, calling foul. So I'm actually kind of mixed on this one. I wouldn't go as far to say a traitor, but, uh, but it's an opportunity for me if we were to have a debate about whether Edward Snowden is a traitor or a patriot, who, are, who am I? Who are you? Who do you, I want to be? Who do you want to be? What do you think you know? What do I think I know? Where do you feel safe? You feel safe with me in an argument. You feel safe with somebody else. And what are your values around that particular lightning rod? Okay. Now, it wasn't Edward Snowden as the lightning rod. It was Stuart Reed's keynote at Eurostar in 2010 that provoked me. His title was, When Passion Obscures the Facts, The Case for Evidence-Based Testing. If only he would do it. <laughs> yeah, see, we're getting into it right now. Um, 
So he had three bullet points on his uh, abstract. How testing, quote, evangelists, even right there, you know, you kind of feel it like oh, the little knife there, little jab. Okay, maybe that's just my baggage, I don't know. Um, we'll get to that. How testing evangelists use their apparent passion to conceal a lack of evidence supporting their claims. Which claims are supported by evidence and which are just plain wrong and which lack real evidence and how we should collect metrics to provide evidence to support testing improvements. Even, I mean, just as this was published, right, and I, I saw it, I just knew that this was ridiculous, ridiculous talk, full of, of uh, uh, bias. For example, all I have to do is say evidence and, and look, at the, look at the word evidence. Evidence-based testing. Now, Griffin Jones is going to talk about evidence at CAST. And I've got it right here, as a matter of fact. He's talking on uh, 11 o'clock on day two. By marshalling credible and persuasive evidence, influential testers answer three basic questions. How good is the product? What testing did you do? Was th why is the testing any good? Feeble evidence and the behavior associated with it are common testing maladies and threats to your ability to tell a compelling story. I totally agree. Evidence is contextual. In fact, there are, there are rules of evidence in court. There's circumstantial evidence isn't there? So to say that there's one right thing to look at, and oh, by the way, I have the data to expose these evangelists, quote unquote, as concealers, because of an agenda that they have, which he doesn't say what it was. It got me going. It provoked me. And I was ready for a fight. So I decided to write a blog. Oh, this is more of Stuart stuff. It is often those who speak the loudest, those who speak most persuasively. Thank you, Stuart. I'm sure he meant me and James. And those who appear the most passionate, swaying opinion mainly by sheer force of personality. And you get to see a little bit of, of the subtext there. Now, am I reading more into this? You could argue, argue. Yes, I might be. But remember, I have that experience from CAST 2006 with him and James doing the debate, and, uh, and so that kind of stuck in my mind. It wasn't much of a debate, in my opinion. Um, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of data that was presented, for example, at that time. Anyway, he has six bullet points here. Will exploratory testing detect more bugs than scripted approaches? And right away, it, any kind of measurement like that is fallacious. It's, it depends on the context. It depends on how you define bugs. It depends on what you mean by scripted. You can do scripted exploratory testing. Yes, you can. Take a, take a test procedure and use it as a charter. Use it as a guideline. Are you doing scripted testing or are you doing exploration? It's, it's up to you how you define that. So just, just the question number one. This is, this is the foundation of his argument. Is a certified tester more effective than those without industry certification? Oh boy. Here we go. How is he going to measure that? Or apparently he had measured it and he was going to present data about that. More effective how? To whom? Under what conditions? Certified what? A 40 question multiple choice exam? Certified what? By going through a 20 week body of knowledge, intensive practical, a four-year degree? What does certified mean? And on and on. So, so I fired off a shot across the bow. This is even before his talk. I said, he's, he's going to allow you, apparently, to sort out six specific software testing controversies, some kind of briefcase that he's got full of facts um, that we Svengalis uh, uh, hope never sees the light of day so we can persuade you that we are the light in the way. We are the saviors. We context-driven, passionate folks. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't even say context-driven. It just says passionate evangelists. So the community joins in. 
As testers, we spent many years to be recognized as career tester. And now we have the ambassadors like, you know, me and Stuart, right? And now you're arguing. It's like, mom, dad, really, stop fighting. Company's over, you know? You're embarrassing me. And so James, being James, we need people like James, saying there's a, he doesn't say there's a debate going on. There's an ideological war going on. <laughs> I like his style. Um, and it's a true struggle for the soul of the, of the craft. And I can relate to that. And it tells you something about his values. Let's do another one. What are you trying to accomplish? When does this end? I, I don't want to pick a fight. Listen, I just don't see how this can save the craft. And I don't understand the sway they have. Uh, or do I get, do I not get what you're doing here? And he says, he invokes an analogy from It's a Wonderful Life about Pottersville. If we do nothing, then Potter wins. Right? The little guy needs to stand up and say no. Certification's a racket. And yes, I know ASTQB is a sponsor of CAST. And I'm not going to attack them specifically. Not because I'm trying to be polite, because I have better things to do right now. <laughs> but I'll, I'll have more, more to say about that. But the, the word bullies he uses, and I believe that too. Um, people who take advantage of other people. And then kind of a neutral one. John saying, I don't enjoy confrontation. So, you know, I like that there's people like James and Michael Bolton, he's referring to, who call out something they see as, as harmful. And he says, uh, I'll, I'll just work on advancing context-driven ideas, like the black box software testing online courses and, and other ways to get involved. But he's hoping that the debate forces more of, of us all to think about what we actually do. And I think that's noble. That's, that's good. You know, I'm not saying, hey, you guys all need to start arguing more. I'm saying know where you stand. And that will help us as a whole. Okay, number two. When I'm triggered, I know I need a way to remember that I can slow down and parse. This slide used to read, when triggered, I can slow down and parse the sentiment that's triggering me. But I know I can slow down and parse. I just forget that I can do that. So I changed it. And a lot of you have notes open right now, and you're taking notes like I would be too. And what happens when you get back to your desk? They stay in the notebook, and you forget to read them, and they accidentally kind of fall on the floor one day three weeks from now, and you open it up and like, oh, right. All that stuff that John said about argument and I was going to get involved in black box software testing and oh yeah, I got to do that. I need a way to remember to do stuff like this. This is again, Stuart reads one of the sentences. I can take every piece of that sentence and figure out where the trigger is coming from. Right? It's about me. Okay. So I did some research, and I found this book called Arguing, Exchanging, Exchanging Reasons Face-to-Face -face by Dale Hempel. And we testers should be really good at argument. Every bug is an argument. Every concern we have that we express about the quality of a product is an argument. It's really a suggestion, right? Because they can defer everything we file. Won't fix, by design, or too expensive, maybe later, right? Everything, every single bloody thing we file can be deferred if there's a business justification not to do it. So we don't really file bugs, we make suggestions. Some suggestions more strongly than others. Some we will quit if they don't get fixed, right? Very rare, but we will find our values if a bug we really care about gets deferred, won't we? 
I know it happens for me. I'm assuming it happens for you. So he breaks this down. And you could, you could parse this in a way uh, in terms of filing a bug when you find a bug. And you want to make an argument that it should be fixed. So you can go into thinking mode. You can examine every word. You can go into feeling mode, right? And say, uh, wow, I'm really feeling provoked by this. In fact, I uh, just it happened last night. I was wanting to pick a fight uh, here in the keynote as a demonstration. And I asked Ben, who should I pick a fight with? And he said, oh, Matt Heuser is, uh, is talking about, uh, you know, testers have to learn how to be programmers uh, or else, and uh, testing is really dead. And uh, yeah, you should talk to him. I'm like, what? Heuser? I like that guy. He's got some game. No way. So I went up to him last night. I said, yeah, I hear you're the guy who thinks testing is dead and everybody should be a programmer and the whole thing. He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he clarified what, you know, I was like, oh, I don't know. So many things. But, um, but the point was, I mean, look, listen to what I just said. I identify Matt as being in my community. I was surprised and shocked and concerned <laughs> that he had this opinion. And, and so I went to confront him because I also felt safe actually doing so. Now, I wasn't like full of vinegar, like, ah, I took him down. I was, I was like, okay, I want to do this. Um, so I had a feeling, I had a feeling, and I had a perception. Uh, there's a notion that we testers should jump to conjectures, not to conclusions, and I like that. Because of, uh, for, to, to lobby a case for a bug, we either have to refute or corroborate our conjectures. I don't like that. I like feeling like a scientist, because I am a scientist. Uh, so there's perception, there's anticipa anticipation of what happens if Matt comes back on me and says, yeah, so what do you, got? What do you have to say about it? And I actually would have liked that because I'm like, okay, cool. Can we use this tomorrow? You know, <laughs> Unless he's just not the guy I think he is, but he was the guy I thought he was. And we talked a little bit about what he really meant. And then experimentation. Of course, that's testing too. You can, we can try stuff in an argument. You know, I'm not saying go on Twitter and pick a fight with somebody because we need more argument. I'm just saying don't, you don't have to shy away from an argument because I think there's some stuff in these slides that have helped me. Because, well, I mean, look, I got a lightning rod for a brother. I don't have to do anything. He does all the work, right? <laughs> and he does the work for a lot of us. What I'm taking issue with is there's, he doesn't have any backup. And we've talked about this, he and I. He's like, where were you, man? You didn't, you didn't, you know, support me in that blog post or that whatever. I'm like, because you said it so damn well. I didn't feel I needed to say anything. But he was really telling me, like, hey, I, I want some air cover. I shouldn't always have to be the one fighting. And that's the first quote, is somebody has to be an asshole. And that's him, right? So that's what, it, that's what he chooses. Um, okay, so I made some alternate responses here. Oh, thank you. That's exactly what I need. Um, passion is, this is from Stuart Reed, remember. Passion is often used to conceal a lack of real evidence, blah, blah, blah. So, what I could have chosen to respond with was, I don't believe that, and here's why. I can't believe that, and here's why. I disagree, and here's why. What evidence do you have? What makes you believe that, really? Tell me more. I learned this from Jerry Weinberg. Some of you who just took PSL last week, I took problem solving leadership in the year 2000, just changed my life. It was, I, I learned I was an ESFJ. Do you know what that means? Uh, yeah, it's a Myers Briggs type. And we all, all ESFJs had to sit together. And it was like, wow, you're just like me. You like, this, you like service. We like. Like, like what Don Haynes usually does. She likes doing the registration table. That's her, that's her wheelhouse. That is where she shines. That's where she wants to be. And we need that. You know, we need people who are service-oriented. So anyway, I learned this from PSL. Really? So let's say I'm really triggered and I'm provoked and my heartbeat is really up, you know, heart rate is. I go, really, testing is dead. Tell me, tell me more about that. 
and I just calm down a little bit and let, get some more context. <laughs> Even I have to remember, you know, context. Really tell me more. Well, what about, pa- he, he remarks about passion as obfuscating the real thing. Well, what about passion on their side? Right? Uh, aren't, aren't, isn't there some obfuscating on the, on the certification side that, oh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Uh, ASTQB, gold sponsor of CAST. What is the return on investment ROI of ASTQB software testing certification? Various studies estimate the cost of a post-production software defect in the range of $4,000 to $5,000. If ISTQB software testing certification can help a software tester to eliminate just one post-production defect in his or her career, the return on investment for an ISTQB exam could be as high as 2,000%. With our new volume purchase program, that ROI could be even higher. Sounds pretty passionate. So you can ask, are you frustrated with something? Like when you provoked yourself, right? And you're, you've got, someone's making an argument. Passion is often used to conceal a lack of real evidence supporting the opposing positions. Sure, you sound like you might be frustrated. Maybe just me. It's kind of a tell me more thing. You can ask, what did you see or hear to believe that? You can say, I, I agree to some extent, but... What is the opposing position? Why do you think people are being influenced? What benefits have you seen by having your positions? What are you really saying? On and on. What are you afraid of? That's another one. Um, uh, You can just totally change the game. So, in studying both the the argumentative responses and the more more docile uh, uh, ones, or the more ones that invite conversation (laughs) instead of an argument, I looked up uh, argumentation, and I learned about this guy named Stephen Tolman, who's an English philosopher, and he breaks down an argument into these six, or six, one, two, three, four, five, seven, nice bug, John. Um, (laughs) Oh, I found a seventh, and I decided to delete it. I don't know what I did there. Uh, I'm not, I just uh, put the diagram in. I'm not sure how the diagram works, but I wanted you to see it if you wanted to look it up. Uh, But anyway, so... Uh, claim what is the uh, what's being what's the position what's being argued for what are the grounds what are the reasons are supporting evidence right he's uh, you know, Stuart Reed purportedly had this evidence so let's hear it what is the principal provision or chain of reasoning that grounds that reason to the claim what support or uh, or justification to back up the principal provision or chain of reasoning What is the rebuttal or reservation? Any exceptions to the claim? And is there any specific uh, specification of limits to the backing? In other words, the degree of conditions, like context. That's what, context was mine, by the way. I put it in parentheses. And this comes from, uh, there's the link down there. Now, I like like, uh, uh, models like this that help me distill what's really going on, kind of like a bug investigation. Right? We can look at it through a white box means. We can put a. We can do static analysis. We can uh, try it on a different kind of machine, another environment, another context. But we can break down uh, a failure to get to the fault. For years, I didn't know the difference. I thought fault and failure were interchangeable. But I know now that a failure is kind of is the thing that the, the symptom. I define it as the symptom of the problem. And the fault is the underlying root cause to the degree that you want to dig until you're satisfied. Right? You can say, well, the root cause of everything is because we are alive on this planet. That's, that's the problem. There's your problem. Is <laughs> we're human. <laughs> Try putting that in a bug report. Oh, you know, I'm human. Right? The developers are human. That's why it happened. It's a little, going a little too meta on that one. Okay, so that breaks down an argument. Another lesson that I've learned is I'm being tested. Guess what? I am software, and so are you. I feel like Stephen Colbert. I am America, and so can you. I am software, and so are you. Uh, I am programming. I am my programming. I am a product of a quote-unquote broken home, by the way. My parents divorced when I was two, and my father went off to write books and different things. In fact, there was a, there was a quote in one of his books I forgot, to, uh, I forgot to add in the, as a slide. 
And one of my favorite quotes of his comes from a book called Illusions. Uh, the subtitle of Illusions is The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. And it's a book about an airplane mechanic who happens to be a savior, like Jesus Christ or Buddha, one of those guys. And all he wants to do is fix airplanes. Um, but people keep asking them to, or him to heal them. And it makes his life complicated, so he keeps running away. He keeps getting into his antique biplane and <laughs> flying away and being a barnstormer. And in the book, my dad's character, who is also a barnstormer, meets him, and they talk about life, the universe, and everything. And one of the, one of the things that my dad discovers about this character, right, my dad's character discovers about the Messiah character, is they give you a guidebook when you're a Messiah. And my dad's character asks, well, let, let me, can I see it? Can I see the guidebook? Oh, sure, here it is. And it's pithy quotes about life. And one of them is, Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. All right, that's kind of neat. Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, like, I'm not worthy to do a keynote. I don't, I'm too nervous. I don't know what I'm going to say. I've tried new, I, I, new material. It's being recorded, and I'm worried that I'm going to say something wrong. I can't do this. And so before going on stage, I just quit. Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. Or I can say, you know... I'm nervous, I'm going to do it anyway because I trust that my community is going to uh, let me know uh, how I can improve. And uh, besides, I need to say this. And I go up and I take the lectern and here I go. So I'm being tested. And so are you. Because our programming is that, to bring it back to my, my slide, a test tells us a couple things, who I am and who I could be. It's an opportunity. Am I going to be a voracious debater in the, on this issue or am I going to just relax a little bit or am I going to wait for more data? Who am I? Am I going to throw a punch on the, to this guy? What am I doing? I'm being tested. And all these things I put on the slide are important components to that. Now, there's one thing that you may be looking at going, okay, yeah, I got all the things. Problem versus actual, what? I need to talk about something that occurred to me when I was, well, it was two years in testing and I was about to do my first talk at Star West 2000. And I was working for my brother at the time and he was grilling me pretty hard. He just wanted me to go in front of an easel and, and say, okay, we're going to talk about it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I want to talk about session-based test management. He said, okay, fine, go, talk about it. And I started talking about it, and I was just all over the map, and I was hesitating and umming and eyeing, and I was kind of flush, and my heartbeat was going fast. And, and he said, he stopped me, and he said, just, just take it slow and tell me what the, what the problem is you're trying to solve. And I, again, I was just trying to figure out, like, okay, this method is a way to, to like manage and measure your exploration, and then this is why it's cool, and here's the components. And he said, okay, wait. There, uh, a problem is, is this simple. Like, you have a desire, an expectation, and, uh, and then there's reality. And if they're different, that's a problem. And there's two ways to fix a problem. One is to change reality, <laughs> change the world, bring it over to meet your expectations, or you can relax. Just let it go. Right? And say, that's okay with me. So, the problem versus actual is a, a problem by definition is a delta between what I want and what I get. And that is, that is why I think one of the tenets of Buddhism, actually, is all desire causes suffering. And I thought, well, what a lame way to live, right? With no desire. And actually, I learned that it's, it's not, you're not supposed to have any desire. It's release your attachment to the desire. Want what you want, but don't collapse into a, uh, you know, a, a, a wreck, you know, when that doesn't happen. 
So it's a way, problem versus actual is a reminder for me to go, ah, okay, okay, I'm being tested. Uh, how do I either change the world or relax uh, in this situation? Okay, uh, I'm married. I've been married for 13 years. That probably tells you a lot right there. If, you're, if you've had any long-term relationship, you know that you're bound to get into some disagreements from time to time. And so I've certainly had those with my wife. And she taught me about something she was studying called nonviolent communication. And um, it's, uh, it's broken down into, it's a method to break down uh, a communication paradigm into different things. Oops, sorry, let me take one at a time. So you start with an observation. Um, and uh, you know, I notice that you're upset. I notice that you seem sarcastic. I notice that, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then you talk about a feeling you have about that. And then express some kind of need. And then make a request. So it goes like this. When you say, passion is often used to conceal a lack of real evidence. That's an observation. I heard it being said or I saw it on a blog or in the abstract in this case. I feel attacked, angry, dismissed, whatever, some kind of feeling, mad, sad, glad, happy, <laughs> whatever, usually not happy, but I feel angry, attacked, and dismissed because I need you to respect people who are passionate and honest, which I feel I am, as I am trying to be, say. Would you be willing to consider that speakers and writers like me in testing who are passionate can also be honest? So I could have framed it that way and see, you know, they say well, you get more flies with sugar than you do with vinegar or whatever it is. Now, I don't expect my brother to use this kind of tactic. It's just not his style. But I have seen him be a master facilitator. Really, seriously, you should see him facilitate something like cast. Uh, he parks all that fizz, if you will, that, that energy, and he just, uh, he's actually one of the most compassionate moderators I've ever seen uh, and I've seen him at, at his best it's just at a conference he just gets triggered he just he just won't go to talks if he knows he's going to be upset he just won't go he could sit in the front row and totally badger the speaker he could sit in the back row and lob hand grenades he doesn't do that he just won't go because sometimes I'll go and I'll go wow did you, did you believe that guy and what he said he goes no I didn't go I knew I'd just be too upset so that's his way of being nonviolent. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put himself in a position where he has to fight. <laughs> he will admit this. He will, and I, I think that's noble. He knows his limitations. He's argued for them. He's okay with that. Right? Okay. Um, There's a commenter on a, about this whole Stuart Reed thing. He said, uh, I, don't, I think nobody should judge something on assumptions, let alone argument on it. In other words, they're taking issue with me for taking issue with Stuart because I hadn't even heard the talk yet. All I read was the abstract and I fired a salvo. So Michael Bolton comes to my defense. Thank you, Michael. Yes, welcome to being human. But he looks at a, that quote from Stuart, how testing evangelists use their apparent passion to conceal a lack of evidence supporting the claim. Is this an assumption-free or value-independent statement? doesn't sound like it. It sounds like there's some freight there. Their apparent passion seems kind of like, hmm, interesting way of wording that. So yes, here's James, the reasonable guy. At, during this, this debate, during this kind of uh, contention about Stewart's talk, he even says, I bet I sound like I'm being I'm short-tempered about this because I, I am. Um, but here's why. You know, I shouldn't pretend to be sanguine when in fact I'm, I just want to beat my head against the table. And he acknowledges that he had a good experience recently at that time in May debating an ISTQB rep that left him with a respect for that person, a man of honor, and a good listener. Think of James as a knight. I mean, that's his idiom, right? That he's actually pretty reasonable. I like that he's a warrior, but he... You know, he gets a lot of flack in our community. I don't know if, any, if everybody sees posts like this, but he does make them on his blog. Um, 
It's, it's, it's not all uh, vitriol and just throwing hand grenades. Um, okay. Lesson four. Remember, I have five. I'm almost done. I promise. I'm good on time. Yes. Here's another thing I learned from my dad. My dad, the self-help writer. Uh, have you ever been angry? And if you parse that a little bit, if you think about what's going on, and maybe because you're afraid of losing something. If you accept the fact that anger, all anger is based on some kind of fear. And when I think about when I've been angry, and I think about what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of losing? It's these things, credibility, standing, self-respect, self-respect, time and energy, right? Let's say you're arguing with someone and it feels good, like you're making your point, right? It could be not a software testing argument, but what, whatever it is. And it starts off slow and it kind of boils and boils and then you're like, you're, st you're not being heard and you just go, that, you flip the bit. I'm done, I'm walking away, right? You're, you're losing your time, you're losing your energy, and you can just go, I, I'm, I've, I've lost my power, I'm, I, I can't do this anymore. So that, is, uh, that helps, that helps me. Um, I, sh I should have written on here, um, I have a conjecture <laughs> that all anger is fear and all fear is, is fear of losing something. I just like the way that, that works for me. And I urge you to consider that next time you're angry about something. It may be hard to do that in the moment, but when you have some time, like, okay, what did I, I got really angry, what did I just lose? Or what did I almost lose? So, I got angry when I learned that, El, El, I think it's supposed to be Alberto, I think it's a typo, sorry, Alberto. Alberto Savoya, I know he, uh, some people in this room uh, like and respect him. I. I think that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but he did say test is dead at uh, Google Automation Conference in 2011. And uh, so he goes, testing is dead. And I could say politely, no, it isn't. No, I could say, <laughs> I could say <laughs> bullshit. Or I could say, what? You don't know what testing is. Have you ever tested? That's ridiculous. You're being ridiculous. Are you serious? You're kidding. You can't really mean that. You're, are you crazy? What the hell are you talking about? Well, maybe at your company, it's dead, right? So I could be full of vinegar, right? I could, I could do that and just go, okay, yeah, it feels good, right? Like, mm, no one pushes me around. This is my community. I'm a tester. No, I'm not dead. You're saying I'm dead. I'm not dead. Or, <laughs> or I can say, I don't believe that. I disagree. What evidence? Tell me more. Dead in what way? Are you afraid of something? What are you really saying? Or I can do NVC. When you say that, it makes me mad because you diminish the craft. And I, at a time when I think we should be building up the craft, would you be willing to reframe what you said? So here is what I parsed from the YouTube. You can watch it on YouTube, what he said. And as I watched it, I kind of got an idea of what he was saying. That he said, testing the old, there's an old mentality where it's rigid or all these requirement docs and specs and test and dev are different, different and they're siloed and stuff's thrown over the wall and software isn't released till it's ready, which I think makes sense, right? It's released till it's ready. Uh, roles and responsibility. <laughs> roles and responsibilities, well, yeah, okay. And oh, there's a new mentality where it's iterative and there's CI going on and it's shipped now, fix it later and no roles and everybody's an engineer. And uh, I'm like, okay, that's, that's what he's saying. And, I'm, and so I'm like, okay. And then Whitaker does his own thing at QASIG, the uh, Quality Assurance Special Interest Group in Seattle, uh, where I was chairman for many years. Um, this is after I left. <laughs> you can tell I was the speaker chairman for a long time. And then as soon as I leave, oh, we'll get Whitaker in here to talk. And I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for waiting. Glad to be out. Um, so as I heard him talking, it's a recorded one, you could judge for yourself. What I took away was, uh, yeah, okay, we'll give it all, they'll give all the testing to the users to do, because if you're simulating a user, that's bad, he says, and, uh, and we'll give it all the programmers. So, um, so these are quotes, it doesn't matter who does the testing as long as it gets done. 
let me just let that one sit with you for a while and see how you feel. Of course, I'm biased and I'm, you know. But actually, during open season, yeah, if you, if you agree with this, just let me know. I'm, I'm not going to let you have it. I just want to talk, okay? I just want to talk. <laughs> the product is the focus, he says, not the role. Testing gets managed in the dev workflow. We don't need the role of testers. We don't need that role. That's like so 1990, right? Or whatever. So as a tester, I'm like, oh, you're saying that I need to be a programmer now and S debt, and then I can quietly go away. Because uh, checking is the thing that, that's really, really saying, Mr. Whitaker, right? Checking? I don't think he makes a division between checking and testing. Checking is quick and confirmatory and automatable. It's a procedure. It's meant to be quick and confirmatory. Testing is investigatory, exploratory, right? So checking is a subset of testing, in my opinion. And frankly, at a company like Google or even eBay, we do need a lot of checking. There's a lot that's happening on the site. We're making a lot of changes, and we want to make sure we didn't just break something. Checks are good for that. But I don't believe that's the only thing that we should be doing is just checking. So he says, quote, when I asked someone at Google what they do, and they reply, well, this is, he was at Google then. He's now at Microsoft. Uh, when asked what they do, and they reply, I am a tester. This is a problem employee, he says. The minute you start associating yourself more with your role than with the product, your company should fire you immediately. Again, another lightning rod, just like my brother James. And he's trying to provoke, I think. Except, except, I, these are quotes. Push your developers to more modern languages like, hey, that's a role. That's an association with the role. The minute you start associating yourself more with your role than with your product, that's a role, Mr. Whitaker. Prevent your devs from being idiots. Again, another charged word that meant to provoke. Dev is a role. I like to put the new devs on test because they learn. That's a role. His joke, don't ever ask a dev a question. Oh, you don't ever ask a dev a question. You make a statement that sounds really wrong because they like to tell you when you're wrong. Devs were incentivized to show t how, test, how wrong test was. Again, dev, 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 dev. That's a role. So, um, so I was confused. Isn't that someone more interested in building something that customers will love than playing some role? I don't think so. It's, I believe in roles and responsibilities. I know if you're in, in the Agile camp, I know that there's less. Someone said it yesterday. I forget who I was talking to, and I, I apologize. I forgot who you were. But you said something really profound, and you said, it's not role and responsibility. It's focus. What's your focus? I'm, well, okay, I can accept that. I still like being a tester. But true to form, my community came to my aid. Not because I was in particular need publicly to debate Mr. Whitaker on this, but they did it for me. Eric Jacobson, Ben Kelly, and Scott Barber, two of which I think are in the room. I don't know if Eric's here at CAST, but I think he's been before. They each blogged about Whitaker and the whole test is dead thing. Eric said, the common thing here is that programmers are getting better at testing and testers are not getting better at programming. You know, I could kind of see that. I am one of them. I am not a programmer. I know it's important to understand basic things like methods and classes and et cetera, et cetera. Where there's recursion, you know, how that might help me be effective in finding bugs. Absolutely, I agree. There's just something about programming that I just, it just bounces off me. I just, it's hard for me to get it. I'd rather look at it from a holistic point of view. I looked, I looked at software like, all right, um, what's the context? When are we shipping? Who's it going to? What's our comp competition? All that kind of stuff. Ben Kelly says, the faster that fake testing dies, the sooner the rest of us can get on with it. You know? And I thought, hey, maybe I've got it all wrong. They're, wa they're wanting bad testing to die. I want that too. I want test cases to die to some degree because I think test cases are useful, uh, especially as an exploratory charter, right? And especially for new people who are coming up to speed who need to know step by step through someone else's lens even how to get something done. Um, so I like Ben's quote. I like Scott's quote. Software testing today, in my opinion, is dominated by the underinformed leading the undertrained to do the irrelevant, right? And that's his opinion. And I thought, okay, maybe that's why testing, a, a kind of testing 
defined by these guys should die. And then Heuser and Pat Sullivan and Ben uh, and Scott uh, made a podcast about testing is dead. And there's the link. It's uh, from Twist, This Week in Software Testing, December 2011. And I liked, because they're part of my community too, I mean, they, I've, they've also earned a lot of trust credit with me. Um, and uh, I liked each of these quotes. Uh, we need to adapt and evolve to better understand what matters to users. Uh, goes into, testing goes into the business. Why not allow them to bring the skills they have? Just great stuff. And it just took away a lot of that a feeling of I'm losing, I'm going to lose, I'm dying, I'm being attacked, I'm going away, people want to kill me, right? Because the cavalry came in. And Scott suggested this, almost done. Testing as we've come to know it hasn't gone anywhere in the last 15 years. You know, I don't think it's going anywhere now. I mean, yes, I know there's this S debt. Everybody's a software design engineer and test and the continuous integration and more agile and DevOps and this whole thing. But maybe the way we traditionally think about testing doesn't apply anymore. And he's saying maybe. He's throwing out an argument to consider in a, in a safe way. To which Ben added, well, the regulated industry hadn't changed that much at all. You, f you fight that old stereotype that Dev throws it over the wall. And it's a struggle and it, it can't stay that way. And I agree. I think there should be a wall between Dev and test, by the way. I really do. I just don't think the wall needs to be so high. Right? I want them to figure out how to how to make it meet those requirements, implicit, explicit, whatever, right? And then I want them to rely on me to find the stuff they missed. It's like an email, like writer, copy editor relationship. If I'm writing an email to John Donahoe, CEO of eBay, I want you to look at it before I send it. I just want to take a day and say, do you need to just check me on this? Remember a check, quick confirmatory, right? Or I can say, test this email. Go a little bit deeper. So uh, I believe that uh, testing is uh, this questioning, interrogation, and investigation in the pursuit of information to aid some kind of evaluation. Sorry for all the shunts there, but I like the way it works. Uh, Michael Bolton has something to say about that. Um, let's see, what was I going to put on this slide? Oh. We're finding out the extents and limitations of the product and its design. We're largely driven by questions that ha haven't been answered or asked before. I don't see programmers being a whole lot of interested in that. Do you? I don't. I think this, this validates me as a tester and you as a tester and the craft of testing, not DevOps or SDET or checking. So I thought, okay, what am I afraid of losing? And these are, again, these are the quotes in blue. Can't we all just get along? Can't we respect each other? You're just diluting the message by your fighting, you're arguing. You guys say testing is dead and you say no it isn't. So the last lesson is maybe when you're losing you can reframe an argument to something you can relate to. For example, testing is dead. How about this? Testing is journalism. Now yes, I know newspapers are dying. I'm a journalism major, 1990, University of Maine. A lot of good it's done me, right? 20 years almost in software testing, 18 years. But I still consider myself a journalist because newspapers are dying, but they're, they're taking on a new form. Newspaper 2.0, CNN, Twitter, uh, Facebook, ESPN. If you want to know the gold prices, there's whatever, gold index, the XKCD for your funnies. Right? You got your advertisements. You got your Bill of Rights. You know, <laughs> this is the newspaper. It's just online now. All the stuff that's in the newspaper is there. Information itself is flourishing. And, and the parallel is testing isn't going anywhere. Neither is journalism. It's just a different form. So like testing, journalism is a skill meant to shine light upon ignorance in a trustworthy way. And people need to trust information. And as long as they need to trust information, there'll be need for journalists. You can argue someone tweeting in Egypt about the, the protests isn't a journalist. Oh, I don't know. I, it's information, and I have to decide if I trust it. But I can apply the same thing to testing. Testing is a skill meant to shine light upon ignorance in a trustworthy way. As long as people need to trust information, there will be a need for skilled testers. Uh, and again, another, another model for, uh, we haven't talked about morals at all yet, and I, and I won't. I just put this slide up 
because I met someone on the plane who was overlooking, uh, looking over my shoulder or next to me, looking at my slides. And he was really intrigued, like, what is this about, if you don't mind me asking? And I, he apologized. I said, no, no, this is for a keynote about uh, software testing and, and I'm going meta. And it uh, turns out he was a researcher. And he told me about, he had a handout in his research. He was uh, doing research for a medical device. And he said, uh, I got this paper and I haven't read it yet, and, uh, but I, I'm really interested in it. And he showed it to me. And it turns out that he was talking, it was talking about moral impulses. And I thought that was useful in talking about argument. Like what, what we're worried about, whether it be liberal or conservative or testing is dead and no it isn't, is you can look at something from a harm or a care point of view, like morals. We all care about people. We all believe it's wrong to hurt people and it's good to relieve suffering. Or you can look at it from a fairness or reciprocity point of view. Justice and fairness are good. Everybody would agree with that, right? But, and, and all these things, authority and respect and purity and sanctity, Everybody in the room would agree on this, no matter what your politics are, yet we fight. Because we may have interpretations of what's harmful and what's, what, what care means, or what fairness and what reciprocity is. There was a, something I read that the environmental movement was started by liberals, but it's been taken up by, by Christian evangelists, that you, know, you don't do harm to God's planet, right? Oh, okay. So I thought that was interesting. Anyway, in closing, <laughs> thank you, Paul. Yes, you are closing. Yes. Uh, those are the five lessons. Uh, I will leave them up there. Now what? Now let's argue. It's, uh, it's open season. Um, I have no profound punchline other than thank you for letting me vet some new material. I am still, still honored to be on this stage and speaking to what I consider to be my community. And I do feel safe, even though I don't know you, but we're about to test that, aren't we? So let the games begin. Thank you very much. Thank you. One thing I forgot to say when I was giving you the instructions, make sure that I write down your number when you say it. 134 red card. Uh, it's his own notes, but ah. we'll see. Move what over where? You, the, I was just I saying that. A I, did, I got I did, you a flip This chart. is the time I want the flip chart. See? Don't go too far, you'll be at a camera. Oh. All right. Oh. And do not talk until you have the microphone, uh, otherwise, uh, um, How much time do we, we will make okay. you start again. Right, it's 10 minutes over, so. You are down to, if we break at the right time, you're down to a 20 minute open season. Okay. Uh, I got Doug 80, 156. Did I miss anybody? 157. Oh, thank you. 112. All right, I think I have everybody. I have uh, 80, Doug Hoffman, too far away, I can't see his number. 156, 157, 112. That's it. All right, we'll start with 157, Simon, right in front of you. Um, my name is Samba, and uh, my name is Samba, and my question is, can you interchange uh, argument and discussions? Uh, the reason I ask that is, uh, like, the argument you presented is more at a higher level. Like, you can argue that, you know, testing is important or not, or it should be done, or should not be done by testers, per se, it should be done by developers. But if you all go back to our various work areas on Thursday, for example, and you go back to our team, at a, I mean, at a work environment, argument is seen as something, you know, uh, uh, negative to a certain degree. So, uh, but I also saw you presented a soft part of argument where, for example, instead of saying BS, you can say I sincerely disagree. Mm. So, I mean, are the two interchangeable or can you dwell more yeah. on argument and... Okay, here's what I, let me, thank you for the question. Uh, can you interchange argument and discussion? Uh, I had a problem when I was uh, coming up with the abstract and thinking about what I really wanted to say. And it had to do with the word argument. And argument, uh, there's a couple of perceptions. Argument as a heated exchange. Like, no you didn't, yes I did. You know, screw you, and I hate you, you know, those kind of things. 
Or an argument like, let me make an argument. Like that, right? Uh, testers make arguments. Uh, this bug should be fixed. Let me make an argument about that. And they pre present the evidence. And then their testers will go, no, you will fix this damn bug. And I'm, I'm done. See ya. You know, that kind of argument. And then you, and the developer says, uh, listen, the, no, no, it's not going to happen. And you go, well, then, then we'll, see, we'll see about that, won't we? So can you interchange argument and discussion? Uh, certainly. There's, a, there's the soft kind of argument, like, let me make a case for this. And I, I, when I was doing this talk, I'm like, what am I going to, what do I really want to say? And it was the charged argument part. I had a version where I was talking about argument as experimentation, like, let me make a case for this. But I really wanted to tell everyone in the audience and those listening out there that I think we need more uh, charged discussions, if I may. So I will use them interchangeably, I guess, in, in terms of the argument that I mean in, these, in this slide, this slide deck, and uh, in the discussion, just a, a more, more charge to it. If, if that does any service to your question, but I think that's what you're fishing for. Yeah, I, I, I find that the purpose of argument is to persuade, although not necessarily persuading the person you're arguing with, because oftentimes it's what I would call a religious argument. Uh, we're not going to change each other's positions. Uh, but James and I do this uh, at CAST, what, right. two years ago, uh, about schools uh, of uh, testing. Having an argument uh, for the purpose of educating others. Mm -hmm. Good point. There is, uh, uh, by the way, Paul, I, I listened to your preamble about the K cards. Is I didn't hear the yellow. Is there a rat hole card? No. Okay. There used to be a yellow call, card called the rat hole card, where it's like, guys, we're getting nowhere. Really testing metrics. Are they good or bad? Again, we have to hear this discussion. Rat hole. Right? So you're right. There are some arguments that are meant to persuade, but they're like religious arguments. Like, well, are you going to be saved by Jesus Christ or not? And so, well, no, I have a different point of view. Well, then you're going to hell. See you later. You know, it's like, okay. is that what cast is really all about? Is trying to you know, impress my doctrine upon you? Well, I don't know. Let's see what happens as long as, I mean, that's, and I think in some of the blue slides, some of the people appealing to, hey, can't we all get along? I think what they're really saying, in fairness to them, I didn't take them out of context. I just, I put them in a bucket for, for demonstrative purposes. They may be saying, really, can't we just uh, uh, treat each other uh, with this kind of, uh, um, well, not respect, but uh, we don't have to call each other idiots, do we? And, and names, can we like, at least not call each other names? Because my, my brother doesn't shy away from that. You know, he'll call you an idiot, right, if you're an idiot. But uh, I think that's really the point, is let's not, de let's not degrade the discussion into name-calling and personal attacks. It's just fair. I accept that. Hi. Um, I just want some, uh, whenever this, this topic comes up, arguments, or I see people arguing, or people are talking about how terrible what this or that person said is, I always feel like I'm missing some context because um, I've been testing for less than a year and almost everything I know about testing comes from people like you and James Bach and Cast and everything you guys say seems pretty reasonable. So I don't know how bad it is out there. It sounds like it's pretty, I don't know. I don't know what the context is. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you can certainly read stuff Whitaker has to say, and Alberto Savoya, and B.J. Rollison, and people who are as contentious on that side, uh, arguing for, it seems like, some kind of discipline uh, that we should be more, I get the impression that they feel like it should be like a military uh, style uh, endeavor, this testing stuff. And uh, where it's all measured with metrics and it's uh, uh, highly accountable and visible. I just, I feel like in my work, I certainly strive for that. I mean, I want to be accountable and responsible to a project, uh, but I'm not going to follow a procedure to do that. I'm going to use my judgment and my skill and my community and the intellect. And, uh, and then there's, there are people who think, 
um, that the certificationists, if I may call them that, are they're just they're a business and they're making they want to make money, and they're it's just a scam, uh, and that's uh, that's a different argument. Uh, so. Um, once in a while, if you follow my brother on Twitter, you'll find him walk into you know this beehive and he'll swat the bees, and uh, that's uh, that's worth watching, <laughs> definitely. Um, but I don't know what to tell you in terms of like, is this really a problem? Is is what you seem to be saying? Is this what? Am I missing something? Uh, yeah, it's I I picked two. Testing is dead, and the certification one. Uh, there are a few others, and if you have one that comes to mind, certainly bring it up here at Cast. I guess extension of that is, as someone who's newer to the community or not able to come to all of these sort of things, it's hard not to feel like white noise just repeating the same things or saying something that someone's already said better. So I tend to watch a lot of these conversations and not join in because I don't know what I specifically have to add or when to add it or when's the right point to come in and not get shot down by the big guns. And yeah. That is, I, I hear your concern as someone, in, uh, if you feel, uh, if you're new to testing and you uh, see something on Twitter or Facebook or on a blog and you go, oh, yeah, I have something to say about that. There's a lot out there that you could research. Um, and let me, let me share a quick thing. In, in knowing what I wanted to say to you guys about argument, uh, I actually went and researched argument. <laughs> and I found these great resources, these models that uh, I was just going to just, it was just going to be like, hey, let's argue more. And here's why I think we need to argue. And uh, okay, open season. It's going to be like a 15 minute keynote, you know, and like, let's bring it. And I would provoke arguments. And I had this great idea to, you know, provoke, you know, Matt and maybe Ben to facilitate and uh, uh, with post-it notes and uh, pick a fight. And then I found all this really interesting research that says, you know, before I fire the big guns I think I can fire. Why don't I do a little bit of research first and figure out something. And the more I did that, the more I realized, oh, <laughs> maybe I'm trying to solve a problem we don't really have. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I still think we have it, but there was that due diligence, oops, excuse me, there was that due diligence of uh, what, what problem I really, am I really trying to solve. And so if you find yourself not knowing which side to take in an argument or you want to come across as credible and, and, and uh, literate in an argument, it won't take you very long to find a blog of somebody who will have said something that you resonate with, whether it be Michael Bolton or Scott Barber or James on, on my side or, or the side I identify with, uh, or another side, um, the pro certification part, it's out there and it, it won't take you that long to find something and then you'll feel safer of course, you have your own experience that nobody can argue with, which is why I made all the lessons into I statements. Okay, so that's it, some advice. Okay, we have just under 10 minutes left. On the same thread, I still have 113. On new thread, I have 80, 112, 92, 83, and 62. So uh, if we can try to get through all those, uh, maybe keep your answers slightly briefer. Oh, and for those of you listening sorry. at home, you're welcome for John whacking the mic like that. I'm sure it sounded great. Yeah, sorry hey, about that online. Same thread. Boom. Okay. Um, one of the things I've railed against for, for years is the publications, uh, the books, and the, the speakers who present their context as the only context that, that they've worked in a silo and believe, or at least represent, that that's the universal way to do things. Um, and the certifications fall into that, where someone has decided this is the universal solution. And uh, my experience has been so broad, uh, and the context approach uh, basically says, yeah, in some context, that might be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But in other contexts, yeah. it's not. Yeah, the, the certificationists make the argument, well, you know, the, your airline pilot has a certification, so does your doctor, right? And you could say, uh, what, I, what I feel like saying in that moment is, in that context, certainly, you'd want a certain demonstration of, of, of skill. 
but even even then you you lose that it's a skill that you cultivate over over time again and again but i think where i where i might for lack of a better word agree is i i do like the idea of a credential in software testing and but the credential could be uh listen i work with james bach done that's my credential you know i'm serious uh, remember years ago when uh, Kim and you and I and others, James, got together for the uh, body of knowledge work, the, the uh, open, open sort of workshop on open certifications. We tried to see what, what credentials could we, and we used that word deliberately. We didn't use certification, we used the word credential. And I thought that was uh, meaningful and that's something I encourage you all to do is examine what your own credentials might be. I believe this is a new thread, but it, it does follow in the whole talk here. We aren't the only com community to go through these kinds of, I'll call it, uh, discussions. Hmm. And I think you want to be careful with the use of certain words, unless you're maybe James Bach, but you, you use very uh, you know, nice words. My kind of observation and, and question is, I think as testers, we want to stick as much as possible to kind of the uh, exploratory scientific method kind of, kind of thing, uh, which in my mind hinges on evidence, information, and you know, logical content uh, versus the irrational. And so I sensed in some of your things occasionally a little bit of irrational uh, in, in what you said. I interpret that, by the way, the same way I interpret things like from Whitaker and Reed and things like that, to be intended to raise the blood pressure a little bit. Uh, and is that your intent? And do you think that's, you know, is that part of your, I'll, I'll call it, uh, presentation here is that a little bit of blood pressure is good sometimes? Exactly. I really, I really don't know how to add to that. It, exactly that. It, it, sometimes I think we need to raise the blood pressure. That's all. Yeah. So I think it's important that you state that, particularly because as we did the beginning survey, there are a lot of new people in the room, okay. and that's an yeah. It's worth data point for the new it's people. worth a slide. It's worth it's it bears repeating. I agree. I should. So I'm uh, new-ish to testing, or at least I feel like it. I'm constantly learning new stuff. But that's why a presentation like this confuses me a little bit why this would be news, I guess. I mean, our role is to challenge assumptions and investigate our preconditions or our preconceived notions about everything. And are we really fulfilling our role if we aren't doing that with how we go about testing? And arguing over that seems like a natural conclusion to our industry, if none other. And I agree, and this slide is my answer. It's, uh, I, I, it's not that I want people to get off the fence. I just don't want uh, people who are uncomfortable with argument to say, you know, please don't fight. It makes me uncomfortable. You know, and that's what I see in these blue comments. Because I do, I think it's obvious, like, hey, if, if it's a really contentious issue, testing is dead or certification or not, yeah, well, pick a side. Because there's like, well, maybe there's some uh, middle ground. Yeah, okay, maybe there is some middle ground. But don't say stop fighting. It only provokes me to fight. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Someone has to be an asshole, according, according to the quote. You asked, how is this topic relevant to testers? Haven't we heard this before? A uh, topic that I keep hearing in terms of testing skills that's come up is emotional intelligence or EQ, emotional quotient. And I think that this talk is relevant to that skill. Maybe you're not in a situation today where you need it, but you may find yourself reacting emotionally. Um, and that's a little flag to you that there's something you should pay attention to here. So uh, thanks for the presentation. It, it helps me raise my EQ. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I, 
Sometimes it's hard. It's hard to notice that, isn't it? It's like we just go ahead and it's, it's like this. When someone, someone like James asks you, test this. You ask for a tester challenge, let's say, and you go, okay, I'm up for it. He says, test this. And he kind of frowns and scowls and say, come on, start testing. Okay, we feel, I feel, <laughs> every, 18 years in testing. I'm like, okay, okay, go into, my, go into my zone. Okay, push back. I can push back. Test, test when? Test now? Test by myself? How much time are you going to give me? Test what? What do you mean by that? Put, get, give yourself some time. And, and that's what I have to remember is that, is that going meta, that EQ. I think it's really important that you pointed that out. And that's why I wanted to do service to that because I feel that, that the one, number one mistake you can make, by the way, when you're given that is to start testing. <laughs> Don't start testing. Don't take the bait. Give Set, the whole secret away. Yeah, <laughs> it's the number one mistake. Yeah, the same thread. I uh, just wanted to echo the comment is, you know, testing and qu questioning really is fundamental to what we do. And so uh, debate is, is an extension of that. You know, I think it's very natural and, and, and should continue and should, should be uh, inherent in, in, in all that we do as testers, in, including methodology and the approach uh, discussion. So uh, I think it should continue and um, should be an inherent part of yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, it'd be nice if there was no war in the world, right? And, uh, but let's say you, uh, you say we take a country that no one's in right now. We just like, we vacate that country, whatever it is. And we say, if you're going to fight, going to have a war, go there and fight, okay? And leave everybody else out of it. But you know, you know that that's not how it works. That's not how the world works. That there's border disputes all the time and there's values going on all the time. And even if there was a little, a little place to us for to go and, and war, that would leak over into other, it would escalate. Some, we got rid of all the weapons, right? Somebody would find a way to make a weapon and then we'd right, be right back where we are now. And I'm just saying that's reality. So when, if you decide, should I fight? Should I not fight? Okay, that's good. Decide if you're gonna fight, decide if you're not gonna fight. But don't say, let's stop fighting and just hope that it be stop fighting. You have to understand why people fight. And that's hopefully, I, I've, uh, in studying this myself, in pre preparation to talk to you, uh, hopefully there's some things here that, that will help you as well. And I welcome that from you too, as, as some ideas of help, helping me understand why people fight. Okay, we are out of time, but because John stole your time by going over time, I'm going to extend the last two people to talk. So 63, or 83, sorry, 83 first, and 52. Good, I'll be quick. Um, the, this uh, throughout this entire talk, my only thought was, if argument wasn't healthy, would we have based courts and government on it? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that this whole talk. Yeah, courts and tried in the court of public opinion. All right, interesting. Cool. Uh, hi, uh, can we go back to the slide with other lessons so I can get the text of it? Oh, or yes. Lesson one. <clears throat> Lesson one? Okay, I can yeah. do that. Uh, um, yeah. There was, yeah. Um, I need to claim my ter territory first before recognizing my opponent's side. Uh, I think like a lot of, I'm guessing that possibly some set of the uh, of testers, I came up through tech support. And one of, like something I guess I would, I, I wanna talk to speak to that, uh, that concept a little bit. Like th there's a way that you can, there's like a rhetorical tactic that you can employ that's like, I want to rephrase what you just said to me it, without actually, so, so you call, somebody calls in, you, they say they're really mad about something, they're, they're starting an argument. You repeat what they said back to them in a different way, and here's why you're wrong, right? So it, like, it's, not, it's not ceding the territory to them. It's not saying that you're, you agree with their position, but you can say, if, if you, how do I put this? If, if you can say that you understand what they're saying, like I'm on your side, I'm going to explain to you why you're, I think you're wrong. And I think that that's like a different way of, like, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say that you're wrong before I say that I understand you. Okay, so if I say Snowden is a traitor, I'm calling it a tech support, by the way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I don't have any friends and I need to get this off my mind, eBay, so, um, no. Um, <laughs> 
So what, how would you handle that then? So you're saying uh, you would reframe it and say this is why you're wrong? You're saying no. I hear you say that Snowden is a traitor, and here's why you're wrong? Or... In the case of Snowden is a traitor, I would hope that you would have some arguments that would back up that position, right? And so yeah, yeah, sure. It, and so once you had, once you made, made those explicit, then I would try to reword your arguments. So oh, I see. To prove to you that I understand what you're very good. Is. Yes, yes. Sympathetic listening, empathic, empathic listening, and then to say, I you repeat it back. Here's what I hear you saying. So you know they can't argue. Well, you you don't know what I mean. If you parrot it back. I think that's a useful tactic, right, uh, in rhetoric, to say, uh, here's what I think you're saying, and here's why I still think you're wrong. So I hear what you're saying. Good, good advice. Yeah, so um, an interesting argument technique that I thought might be worth mentioning is something that I call argument from agreement. Uh, if you've got a math background and you've studied proofs, it, you can do things like, do, do we start with where you agree with the person? Do we agree with A? Do we agree with B? Do we agree with C? Do we agree with D? Well, if you put those together and turn your head sideways and squint, doesn't it make sense that E? And that's when you get to the disagreement. And you've walked them to the place where they're like, well, you kind of proved that based on stuff we already agreed on. And the conversation can go very differently. I see that in a lot of my writing. The risk is the person that I really agree with at the beginning sees A, B, C, and D, and what the heck's Matt talking about? which I think is what led to this whole DevOps thing that John mentioned earlier. <laughs> so if you see that in my stuff, keep reading. I think, Matt, that was a, a great way to end, and here's why. Let me put it back on the slide and the guy I met on the plane. I, I was shocked I didn't have something like this. Like this, I mentioned fault versus failure, and failure is the surface symptom, and the root cause. If we get to the moral argument, maybe, Matt, that's what you mean, is, is the math. The what can we agree on? Is it wrong to hurt people? Is it good to relieve suffering? Yes, good, we agree. Conservative, liberal, yes, good, okay. Now, what's the problem? <laughs> and and let's, un, let's uh, uh, parse the stack and get to the real heart of the argument. I think it's a really wise thing to do. Uh, I just feel really lucky I happened to sit next to this guy. So thank you for the comment. And thank you all. This is, it went exactly the way I hoped it would go. So thank yeah, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Awesome.